There's a task ahead of us and we have to start thinking out action plans of, of what we need to do. Did you, another question? How, how do the our American Burmese people maintain their breed identity if, if, if you're suggesting that we go to, to, to breed with European Burmese? Because then the, the line that makes the European Burmese a distinct breed then gets blurred uh, with what the rest of the world calls uh, Burmese. This is true, and so is that just um, something you're going to have to compromise on? Right now, how do you distinguish a Persian from an exotic? You, you call them two different breeds. Genetically, they're not two different breeds whatsoever. They're a long-haired and short-haired variant. So what people define as a breed is really, I mean, some of it is, a lot of it is supported genetically, but um, a lot of it is, is not. So it becomes down to, should there be a difference between European and American Burmese? You know, I, I, that's not for me to answer. That's for you guys it's to work it. Yeah, there's all there's a whole bunch of differences. So yeah, it's more it's all not all about the head, but um, in the end, you guys have beautiful cats. You know, even National Geographic thought you guys had beautiful cats, right? And. Um, they're a beautiful color. They, uh, to me, they're a wonderful temperament. When I met uh, Roger's cats, I was at his house went 20 years ago. Um, that was the first time I had Burmese all over me. It's like, these, these are lovely cats. They're sturdy, you know, they're nice. They're beautiful cats. And, and how do we keep these guys hanging around? You know, I'd, I'd love to keep them out there and stuff. And so I'm, I'm willing to keep playing. I mean, at this point, I could say, here's your mutation. Thanks, bye. You know, um, but I'm I'm willing to to stay in the game because I think a lot now is when the fun starts, right? Now is when the fun starts. Yeah, but it's going to come down to you guys. Other other thoughts, questions that do you can you remember things that we might have talked about that? Yeah. Not so much about the, the head deformity, but about the, the inbreeding coefficient. Um, I tested one of my cats and she had like a seven. That's yeah, I'm not sure what that means. So uh, yeah. the inbreeding coefficients I know are sorrel rights inbreeding coefficients, right? So kinship coefficients. And what we did when we did our Corot study is we had good pedigrees from the Corots. And we also have a group of cats at Davis that is a nutrition colony. So what we decided to do was just take a bunch of cats at this this one breeding year and then calculate the inbreeding coefficients and just if we did it without pedigrees, just did it genetically, do we get the same sort of values? And the answer is of course yes. If your pedigrees are accurate, you can calculate inbreeding coefficients or you can take a snapshot in time of your population, do the genetic variation and you should have the same answer. The only thing with pedigrees, some of those can be wrong. Right? So, um, so you might not have the appropriate inbreeding coefficient where when you take a snapshot in time, um, that ought to be pretty accurate. Right? So, yeah. On the subject of inbreeding coefficients, uh, which is an area that I was interested in, I have on various occasions seen a five generation pedigree that you look at the five generations and there is no inbreeding whatsoever. But I can go back and I can name the common ancestors all along the pedigree where it narrows back down again within just a couple more generations. So when you talk, my point is that when you talk about an inbreeding coefficient, you also need to specify how many generations you're dealing with. Well, that's exactly right because um, an in, a true inbreeding coefficient should go back to your founder cats. And you could see that, oh, yay, look at that, five generations, I got a pretty diverse cat. You go back that next generation, you might find your inbreeding coefficient is completely different from what you thought. So again, how do you keep track of things like that? How do you make sure you have all those cats in the database? The easier thing to do is take a snapshot in time of your genetic population and get it that way, right? And regarding um, um, inbreeding coefficients, what is st statistically significant in the cats that we are producing down the road? I mean, how many generations back are statistically 
statistically. Yeah, so, so you're basically saying what's, where, where should I stop on my inbreeding coefficient? What are you allowed to breed to? Let's put it that way. What, what are humans supposed to have permission for to, to breed with? Second cousin, and, Second cousin and, and forward, right? Yeah, or closer, right? So, and why do you think that law was made? Because, you know, if you, you bred closer, you would have geeky little children that had, you know, <laughs> hemophilia. It was based, you know, pretty much on the royal family, hemophilia and other diseases like that, right? So that's an inbreeding coefficient of 0.125, I think. Um, I'd have to double check if that's if that's the if that's the number, but that's what you want to try to keep at is first, second cousins, or 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 more diverse. Now there's we're talking about um, not all inbred populations are a problem. One way to test to see if you have a problem is to back cross, breed an offspring back to a parent. If you think you have a recessive trait, ooh, try that. You'll find out very quickly, right? Um, so that's why people do things like that, and that's how you can purge a system of having amyloidosis, like Joan was talking about. Um, but you know, hopefully, we need we can move away from doing things like that uh, using genetic testing and stuff. But that's where we want to try to be: is the lower the inbreeding coefficient the better, yeah. You mentioned that you can do this test for diversity without you know, needing to do the statistics of inverting coefficient. Are you going to be able to offer that test? Yeah, so um, right now that's not up as an option. So right now we do have um, up on the Davis website this cat ancestry test. All right, and what we can do with that, we generate we generate a pile of data using uh, SNPs, so we don't use STR markers anymore. We use SNPs, and we then can evaluate uh, that for a cat, and we compare it to a database. So if you send me a random bred cat, I can compare it to the database of random bred cats around the world and tell you what population it came from. If it's a breed, I can do the same thing. So a Burmese, the first thing that would happen is it would match back to South Asian cats. And then when I did the second tier of analysis, it should fall into a breed category of, Bur of the Burmese breed. Right? Um, so, but then also, if you have enough of that data, let's see if I have that. Yeah. You can plot all the cats from within a breed. These are different populations, but we could pretend it's a breed of cats. You could see that, hey, Euro-Burmese might be over here, and American Burmese are over there. That's pretty gen good genetic diversity. Let's, let's mix those cats together. So you can get a plot within a breed of how they look as far as genetically. We don't have that up as an option yet um, as running this test, but it's the same data, it's just a different analysis. But you have to compare to a data set. And so right now, I wouldn't suggest comparing to my data set that's 10 years old and has cats from all over the place. I would suggest let's start with a new baseline of the cats we have to move forward with now. And then, then we can do things like that. Yes? And we were actually suggesting in the breed council meeting that maybe a lot of breeds ought to consider something like this, right? But if this is all the genetics you have, that's all you have to play with. So it's fine to mix that up, but you might want to bring some stuff in from over here as well. And that might be the random bred cat from Thailand or a whole different breed or something like that. So you can use this information to mix up your cats within a breed, but you need to add in new genetics as well. But it's really helpful if you've got a database of breed mixes. It's like Tonkinese you don't have right now. Right, I don't have Tonkinese right now. So a first step, logically, would be Let's build a beta. Yeah, let's build a database for Tonkinese. Yeah. And Bombay. And Bombay. So we did Singapore. Why did we do Singapore? We did, we did a couple breeds because we thought, we assumed they were going to be very similar. Right? So we first started out the project to pick the most genetically distinct breeds. But then we said, OK, well, we should probably prove to ourselves. So that's why we did Persian and exotic. Right? We did Havana brown and Siamese. Um, and then we did Singapore and Burmese. And we could see how closely related those. So we can 
com certainly see that Havana Brown are mostly a Siamese cat. We can see that we can't separate Persians from exotics. And now we've extended it to Selkirk Rex because we did a study on them recently for their curly coat. And guess what? They look just like British short hairs and Persians. So the only way to define those is going to be by using the Rex mutation. Scottish fold is going to fit into that category as well. And so you guys already inherently know these things. I can prove them genetically as well. So does it really increase our genetic diversity to use another cat? that is so closely related to us? Well, I'm trying to come up with scenarios that are palatable to everybody, right? So, um, <laughs> what if we yeah. Person, yeah. Who would want to do that? Who, who, yeah, you know, so exactly. So what would be the most, I could figure out, I could figure out the from this scale who is absolutely the most different from you. I don't think you're going to want to use that cat, right? <laughs> so yes, we can come up with that. And as a pure geneticist, yeah, let's mix up all the cats in the world. Yeah. yeah, what that would do is that would destroy the cat ancestry test because then you'd never be able to figure out anything, you know. Uh, you know, cats like Australian Mist, they're tough because uh, or not uh, Bermillas because they're a Persian, a Western cat bred with a South Asian cat. Genetically, they fit somewhere in the middle, so they, they don't go to the right place because they're a mix of everything, you know. So there are some breeds that you can't accurate, like the Aussie cat as well. The Aussie cat is one you can't put in the right place. Um, I mentioned Japanese bobtail in the breed council meeting. Their tail came from, the Asia, from Asia, absolutely. But they've been bred so much with Western cats, they look like a Western European cat at this point in time. So you can alter. Uh, over your lifetime, you can alter the whole genetic spectrum of these cats if you want to. Yeah. Art. If we submit swabs to the BGL for the F effect test, are they keeping enough genetic material to be able to? Do all this, um, you know. Um, we're going to have to sit down with them and, and talk this through um, because they do their DNA isolation a slightly different way, okay. and um, so and then we might have to be saying, okay, we need you guys to submit maybe three swabs or something like that. Um, so buckle swab DNA can absolutely be used. Um, we might have to get a few extra swabs out of it, but that's that's no big deal. Um, really out of a cat. Um, so we'll have to, we're going to have to think through an action plan. You know, how can we get this affordable? You know? That project, is, is, is that an issue? If we wanted to do that as a group, is that an issue of funding them? I, I think for any group, yes. Yes, it is. You know, okay. yeah. Right. So, you know, we got to think what, what, what are the real tests we need to have in there and stuff and um, how many cats do we need for a good baseline. Historically, when you do population studies, if you have 30 cats, 30 to 50 cats, depending on the population size, and all cat breeds, you, you know, you're not gigantic populations compared to human populations, right? So, and if you look at any human population study, they'll do 30 to 50 humans because the effective population size, the population that's really actually breeding and contributing to the next generation is much, much smaller than you think it is, right? So if you sample 10% of the population, you're getting what you need to know know about the genetic variation in the population, right? So that's why you don't need gigantic population sizes to you, never, even in human studies, they don't use huge populations and stuff. So um, it can be done. We have the tools to do it. May I ask 